many nice verses in Canto 1, Chapter 5, flipping through. And so wonderful. This section is Narada instructing Vyas because Narada received his knowledge from Lord Brahma. Brahma passed his knowledge on to Vyas. Let's read Canto 1, Chapter 5, Text 16. And then there are several more verses that are also very nice. The chapter is titled Narada's Instructions on Srimad Bhagavatam. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Vichakshano Syarhati Bedi Tumpipo. Ananta Parasya Nevritta Sukham. Pravartamana Shagunar Anatmanas Tatobhavan Darshayas Darshaya Cheshtitum Vibho Vichakshano Syarhati Veditum Vibho Ananta parasya nivrittita sukham Pravartamanasya gunar anatmanas Tatobhavan darshaya cheshtitum vibho Translation, the Supreme Lord is unlimited, only a very expert personality retired from the activities of material happiness deserves to understand this knowledge of spiritual values. Therefore, those who are not so well situated due to material attachment should be shown the ways of transcendental realization by your goodness. Through descriptions of the transcendental activities of the Supreme Lord, Report by Srila Prabhupada. Theological science is a difficult subject, especially when it deals with the transcendental nature of God. It is not a subject matter to be understood by persons who are too much attached to material activities. Only the very expert who have almost retired from materialistic activities by the culture of spiritual knowledge can be admitted to the study of this great science in the Bhagavad Gita, it is clearly stated that out of many hundreds and thousands of men, only one person deserves to enter into transcendental realization, and out of many thousands of such transcendentally realized persons, only a few can understand the theological science specifically dealing with God as a person. Sri Vyasadev is therefore advised by Narada to describe the science of God directly by relating his Supreme Lord's transcendental activities. Vyasadev is himself a personality expert in this science and he is unattached to material enjoyment, therefore, he is the right person to describe it. And Shukadeva Goswami, the son of Vyasadeva, is the right person to receive it. Srimad Bhagavatam is the topmost theological science, and therefore, it can react on the layman as medicinal doses. 
because it contains the transcendental activities of the Lord, there is no difference between the Lord and the literature. The literature is the factual literary incarnation of the Lord. So, the layman can hear the narration of the activities of the Lord, thereby they are able to associate with the Lord and thus gradually become purified from material diseases. The expert devotees also can discover novel ways and means to convert the non-devotees in terms of particular time and circumstance. Devotional service is dynamic activity and the expert devotees can find out competent means to inject it into the dull brains of the materialistic population. Such transcendental activities of the devotees for the service of the Lord can bring a new order of life to the foolish society of materialistic men. Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his subsequent followers exhibited expert dexterity in this connection. By following the same method, one can bring the materialistic men of this age oral into order or peaceful life and transcendental realization. Quite a transition from where the verse started and where it ended up. It started in the understand. Unless they're highly qualified and who's highly qualified in Sage of Pali. And then but it's possible and then those who are expert like Vyasadeva can achieve it, accomplish it. The context for this chapter is <laughs> Narda is visiting the ashram of Valmiki. We're going to be visiting the ashram of Valmiki also. But, you know, a later ashram. But or not. And because before he was in Badrinath, he had a different ashram. I don't know where that is. And being who he was, a literary incarnation of the personnel in God, and he began the work of taking the sound form and put, putting into a written form, as you know. And in doing so, he divided the Vedas to make it easier. The way it's described by our Acharyas is, this is Jiva Goswami's explanation. The Vedas <coughs> are made of sound, and the sound are represent, representations of the sound in various mantras or combinations of syllables that is compared to a big treasure chest of jewels. And in previous ages, Brahmanas were so competent, if somebody wanted this or somebody wanted that or the other thing, they knew which mantras to select from the treasure chest. But because people in the age of Kali, even the Brahmanas in the age of Kali, aren't as competent as the previous ages, he made it easier. He took that vast treasure chest and put it into two boxes. Two, four. He divided the Vedas into four. So some Vedas are for this, some of the, the visions of Vedas are for that, the other thing, and then there's the, the balance. The purpose, according to Jiva Goswami, was to make it easier for the Brahmanas of this age by make, dividing the one Veda into four. And then there was some balance, and the balance became other text with other Sanskrit besides the Vaidika Sanskrit, the Laukika Sanskrit, 
where the itihasas were pr provided and the Puranas were provided. The purpose of them is to help understand the four Vedas. And the purpose of the four Vedas is to understand Krishna, right? Veda is to Eva Bejo. So, having done all of that work and summarized it all in Vedanta Sutra, he sat back considering how did it come out and he was feeling a pinch in his heart, not satisfied. He was very perplexed. Why am I feeling this feeling? And as he was feeling that feeling, who should arrive on the scene but Narada Muni saying, essentially, Vyas, you don't look so good. What happened? I don't know, but I think you know. Can you tell me what happened? Why am I feeling this feeling? And Narada said, you, you, you get an A in your homework, but you haven't, you haven't written anything that's wrong, but you haven't sufficiently glorified the personality of God, and so you should glorify sufficiently the personality of God. And this is part, <coughs> part of that instruction on the composition that he should compose and its purpose. That's what we're hearing, this verse. And is it going to be easy for people of this age of Kali to understand? No. Do it anyway. Do it anyway because there's potency in the messages of the personality of Godhead. In one place, Prabhupada writes that this message of Srimad Bhagavatam acts like a highly potent drug injected intravenously within the body so that it acts at once on the whole body to cure the disease of material existence. But those who are afflicted with the disease of material existence, it makes it difficult the affinity for matter is the opposite of affinity for the personality of Godhead. Or the comparison is sometimes made trying to start a fire while, while pouring water on the fire. Very difficult to start a fire when you're pouring water on the fire. That can happen. You get smoke but you won't get fire. So the glorification goes to the exercise of Vyas and persons like Vyas who are completely detached from materialistic life, that is to say, not interested in activity that enhances one's opportunity or senses contacting sense objects in an enjoying mood. That's materialistic activity. Just in fundamental. Put it in really simple language. I want to enjoy. And fill in the blank. Enjoy what? What's enjoyment? Those objects out there that I don't have, I want. And if I have some, I want more and more and more. It's insatiable. It, it's never satisfied. Material hankering and material attainment of the fruits of one's hankering, it never comes to the point where one is satisfied, satiated. There's always more and more and more. Because it's not, it's because not the position of real happiness. We desire real happiness and we you know, didn't set our GPS straight. We set it, you know, for, for the ditch. We end up in the ditch. There's no happiness in the ditch. So one goes on and on and on and on and on and on endlessly. So back to the, the purport. 
how how common is it to have the qualification to understand the message of Srimad Bhagavatam? That he doesn't quote the Bhagavad Gita verse, but he's paraphrasing the Bhagavad Gita verse. Manusha Nam Sahasreshu. You know the verse? Manusha Nam Sahasreshu. Manu. Manusha Nam Sahasreshu. Sahasreshu. Out of many thousands, Sahasreshu. Out of many thousands of living beings, you may find some who are endeavoring for perfection. Very rare. Many thousands. And of those who have achieved perfection, hardly one knows me in truth. Perfection. This is this, this, this topic yesterday evening about liberation. There's the liberation, perfection, that's definition by negation. Not this, not this, not this. What's liberation? It's not this, it's not that. Neti, neti, not iti. And then when you clear to all the things that it's not, what, you, what are you left with? Depends on what your philosophy is. It can be void or it can be impersonal Brahman. The quality less Brahman. Near Vishesh Brahman. Near Vishesh Brahman. Brahman without qualities. That's not satisfying either. Because that's that, not what happiness is. Happiness isn't... I've been banging my head against the wall and I got a headache, so I stopped banging my head against the wall. Happiness. That's not happiness. What's happiness? It's rare to find somebody that has the interest in becoming free from material entanglement and those that become successful in Nirvishesh Brahman rare and amongst those hardly one knows me in truth so how, what's the qualification for knowing Krishna in truth there's an indication it's not pursuing materialistic pleasures if you don't pursue materialistic pleasures, what do you do? Twiddle your thumbs? And, and to get there, what do you do? Do I just put a blindfold over my eyes and a gag in my mouth and a muff in my ears and I, my senses become inert? Is that what you're supposed to do? No. You, the, 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 the process is the process of purification. That which is not pure become, may help follow the process of making pure. That which is not pure. What's that? Engaging that which is not yet pure in that which is pure. Or supremely pure. Devotional service. Gradually increasing in the intention of not enhancing my piety by these activities. So now I'm in the better position of piety to be an enjoyer of the fruits of activity. You know, like an upgrade to the heavenly pleasures. Yesterday morning, a little earlier than this time, there was a, a Zoom class with the devotees from China, and we were completing part six of the life of Madhvacharya. Towards the end of the life of Madhvacharya, he heard directly from Vyas, just like here, Vyas is hearing from Narada. Madhvacharya heard directly from Vyas. Now, how do you go here directly from Vyas? Because Vyas was so long ago. And the answer is, Vyas is still living, 
but not in a place as accessible to most of us. He's in Badrinath, but you go to Badrinath and you're not going to meet Vyas. Because he's in an upper region, higher dimensional, Sadaputta calls it, higher dimensional region, that Madhvacharya was entitled to. Because he's Madhvacharya. He's Mukhyapran. He's the incarnation of Ayu. And he was very, very, he kept, came for a purpose. And it's, the description is he, Madhvacharya, was with some disciples speaking on his teaching because his guru had instructed him to compose a co proper commentary on Brahma Sutra. Yes, his composition, Brahma Sutra. So he was working on it. And he was speaking on it. <clears throat> and as he was speaking, everyone saw, according to this <clears throat> biography of his life, written by two very prominent and highly educated disciples, <clears throat> everyone saw a light descending, came directly before Madhvacharya, entered the body of Madhvacharya, and Madhvacharya was taken spiritually, to the ashram of Yasadev. It's called Uttar Badri. Uttar. Upper Badri. And the description <clears throat> in this biography was it was more, it was like the spiritual world. It was more opulent than heaven. Abundance of this and that and the other thing. There's no necessity to anything, because everything was there. You know, the perfect ashram. And there, <coughs> Madhvacharya presented his teachings, Vyasadeva gave confirmation, gave certain instructions, and then Madhvacharya descended back to regular Badri. And then he returned back to Udupi and completed his Brahma Sutra work. <clears throat> but he was instructed directly by Vyasadev. So here, Narada is directly instructing Vyasadev on his service. You know, the service is a little different, but quite similar, because the so, so specific of the service is how to help those who are not like you, Vyas, or perfected soul, <clears throat> to be able to understand and relate through the medium of Srimad Bhagavatam, because, because, I'm saying like this, because the, the Vedas, they're compared to the desire tree, Kalpa Briksha, Kalpa Turu, desire tree, Kalpa, desire. And anything you want from a desire tree you can provide. Om Jai Jagadisha Hare. You name it. And the, you know, those who are pious, can receive anything they want. What about a washing machine? Sure. Not necessarily a washing machine, but the intelligence how to build a washing machine. Where the people who built washing machines get the intelligence to build a washing machine? Super soul. And the ingredients to build the washing machine. And, you know, whatever else you want to have. Tesla. Where, where Musk get, you know, the intelligence to do what he did? Or how did anybody get the intelligence to do anything? How does anybody get the, the capacity to do anything? There's a really nice description in Srimad Bhagavatam in Canto 10, Chapter 89. 
where there's a Brahmana in Dwarka who had eight sons that shortly after they were born, they didn't die, they just disappeared. They just disappeared. One after the next after the next. So he went and complained to Ugrasena. What kind of king are you? This impiety of the king has consequences for the impiety of the even the brahmanas. Anyway, t t long story short, it was Mahavishnu who kidnapped the sons of this qualified brahmana in order to get to see Krishna in his abode in the Vaikuntha realm where Mahavishnu Mahakalapur it's called where he resides so things happen things happen Arjun said I'll protect you have child number nine child number nine disappeared Arjun looked at this place, that place, the other place. He decided he had taken a vow, enter into fire if I can't protect your son. So Krishna got his chariot ready and said, don't enter into fire. Let's go get all nine of these sons. Not just number nine, all nine. I know where they are. Where were they? The abode of Mahavishnu. So this far out explanation of traveling in, our, in Krishna's chariot, Crossing through the coverings of the universe, we get a little mini description of Vedic cosmology, and then into the abode of light and into the realm of Mahavishnu. And the opulence, besides the, the light, the opulence of the abode of Mahavishnu is outrageous. I mean, when you read the section. And Krishna and Arjun come before Mahavishnu, and Mahavishnu worships Krishna right in front of Arjun, and he offers prayers to Krishna, and then Krishna states his purpose. He said, yes, I know what your purpose is. Here's the nine boys. I did this just so I could see you. And then Arjuna makes a comment to Mahavishnu that anyone who has any capacity to do anything, it comes from Krishna. Your capacity to do what you did and my capacity to do what I do and anybody's capacity to do anything. And this is even Vishnu Tattva derives capacity from the source of everything. It's a very important Siddhanta conclusion of scripture. Everything comes from a source. And what's that source? Even Mahavishnu. Because that's something that Arjuna says. You're, you're, you're Vishnu. And you derive your power from Krishna. So where does the ability to understand Srimad Bhagavatam come from? Come from Krishna. And what's the obstacle? Affinity for being a separate enjoyer. That's called material life. Where is there the absence of material life? It's everywhere in material, the material realm. So what, what's a, a nice fellow to do? Because the atmosphere is like that. And we took birth here. Why? Because we wanted it. We have affinity. At the same time, we have some hankering for something that's beyond this affinity. So what to do? Nard is giving instruction to be asked what to do. Compose Srimad Bhagavatam. Where even materialistic men or entities, human beings, can wind down their material attraction by 
increasing their attraction for Krishna through these messages of Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's the, the hearing the message of Srimad Bhagavatam is a very good companion with the chanting of the holy name mentioned here, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, made access to this glorious literature, Srimad Bhagavatam, readily accessible through the very same principle, chanting the holy name. Because what's the difference between the holy name and Krishna? No difference. What's the difference between Srimad Bhagavatam and Krishna? No difference. Absolutely no difference. Absolutely no difference. You reminded me when I came here last time we had housewarming and Srimad Bhagavatam installation. And it's not it's Srimad Bhagavatam is not different than Krishna. The holy name is not different than Krishna. So if it's not different, you know, how come we don't get it? We're covered. We have this affinity for enjoying matter. Strong. Or mediocre, but at least. But, you know, to that degree, we're not experiencing the non-difference. But the effect of both is the same. Two things. I'm going to end abruptly. The cleansing of the covering and the awakening of dormant consciousness. Simple. Chaita Darpana Marginum. You familiar? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Shikshastaka. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Shiksha Ashtaka. Eight teachings. Shiksha Ashtaka. The first of them is Chaita Dharpana Marginum. The mirror of the mind becomes cleansed by the chanting of the holy name. So that's the cleansing part. Bhagavatam does the same, cleansing part. And then the awakening part. You know, the lighting of the fire. Because you can't light fire when you're pouring water on the fire. So, so stop pouring water on the fire by this process of chanting the holy name and hearing Srimad Bhagavatam regularly. Because it's the appearance of Ramachandra coming soon. I've been emphasizing, please read R Ramayana daily. A little bit. A little bit. Because it has that effect. These two, same two effects. The cleansing and the awakening. In Ramayana, one of the awakenings is still on the, apparently on the, on the surface, that is, Virtue, because Ram is ideal, virtuous personality. So the awakening of virtue, tendency. And when virtue tendency awakens, what happens? Piety. So society starts to become less dull and more mode of goodness, more Piety, and then the fruits of piety. Now there's a problem with fruits of piety. You can misuse it. Become entangled with the fruits of piety and trying to be the enjoyer of the fruits of piety. That, that's not uncommon. It's common. People do things. Pious people do things in part inspired by the desire to get things. Do something to get something. It's called fruit of work. So pious fruit of work is you do piety to get fruits of piety so you can prosper in this life and the next. The good news is Srimad Bhagavatam, Ramayana also, Srimad Bhagavatam, that's the topic this morning, it, it takes away the tendency to try to be the enjoyer of the fruits of piety. If you take that away, what's left? Krishna should be the enjoyer. It, that's the dormant conscious. That's the consciousness of real happiness. Krishna should be pleased. There's a, a nice description, I'll end, 
There's a nice description by Jiva Goswami <clears throat> of the position of having no material desire. Position of having no material desire by definition is Krishna's happiness. You don't become a dull stone. That's not no material desire. That's that's dull stone. Spiritual desire. Spiritual happiness. That's the position of no material happiness. You, you do the you do the program of negation. Not this. Not this. Not this. And wait a while. What happens? It gets filled up again with this and this and that. Because because the nature of the soul is a tiny sample of God. The drop of water is a sample of the ocean, or that the spark is a sample of the big fire. It has qualities like the big fire. We have qualities like Krishna, and Krishna has desire, so we also have desire. You can't anesthetize it. Even if you anesthetize it, when the anesthesia wears off, there's desire again. There are processes of negation called spiritual processes that are, it's like anesthesia. You just, consciousness becomes anesthetized. You don't feel anything. And that's happiness. You don't feel anything. And then the anesthesia wears off and then you desire there's entanglement again. So what to do? Become free from material desire means to have only one desire. That's Krishna's happiness. Here's the phrase, and this is it. Bhajaniya Parma Purusha Sukha Matra Svasukhatam Matra means only or exclusively. Exclusively what? Parma Purusha Sukha. Parma Purusha Sukha. The happiness of the Supreme. Matra. Sva Sukhatva. Sva, one's own. Happiness is only the happiness of Parma Purusha. That's our original consciousness. That's the sustainable position of happiness. And anything else is unsustainable. Without exception, anything else is unsustainable. Call it a nice name, put perfume on it, and it's unsustainable. Because it's not what real happiness is. Is there such a thing? Yes. By definition, here's what it is. Bhajaniya, the, the Sanskrit, I learned this from Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita. The root word for bhakti is B-H-A-J. The datu for bhakti is bhaj. Bhaj means activity. Senses, sense objects, Activity, engaging the senses in activities with sense objects. But, not for the purpose of enjoying the senses independently, but for the purpose of, bhakti means for the purpose of Krishna's pleasure. That's bhakti. Same senses, same objects, even can be the same activity, like eating, or, you know, singing, or dancing, or this thing, that thing, studying, anything. Earning, you name it, the sing that in. Where Krishna's pleasure, Krishna's happiness is the obje object, the focus, where, where one's attention goes. That's not where we are. We're in that, at best, we're in a mixed position. You know, to, to, to a degree, more or less degree, covered by material ambitions expectations of enjoyment separate. The mantra means exclusively, singularly, squeaky clean, nothing but one thing. What's the one thing? 
Parama Purusha Sukha. And bhakti, the, the practice of sadhana bhakti is the cultivation of that. So, back to the verse. Narada is instructing Vyas, compose such literature. And do it in such a way that even people, materialistic people, they may think the message of the Bhagavatam is the, the material happiness path. It's not. They may think that that's okay, but do it in such a way that they will also become attracted and come to the position of Krishna's happiness. There's everything. That was the assignment. He did a good job. So that's it for this morning's discussion. Tomorrow we'll go on to the next verse, next verse. Nara's instruction to Vyas and Srimad Bhagavatam. Comments? Yes? Hare Krishna Maharaj. That last part that you quoted from Srila Prabhupada's uh, purport, Bhajaniya Parama Purusha Sukha Bhakta Svasukha Dhamma, that the devotee should find his happiness only in Krishna's happiness. Uh, in last night's class, for example, you mentioned that, that when Hanuman is left on the earth, he's doing that because Lord Ram instructs him to. So it'll make Lord Ram happy. And yet, it doesn't appear at first as though he's happy with that decision. Why? Ask him. <laughs> Appearances, you know, there are photos of Prabhupada where he looked very serious. And people would comment, Swamiji, you're always looking very serious. And he, he said, I remember that photograph. It was a moment of ecstasy. <laughs> Don't judge a book by its cover. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, uh, the last point, same continuation of okay. what, same question, same, same uh, Bhaja and Parama Purusha Sukham. Uh, I'm on the other side of the coin, Maharaj, yes. which is like, I'm trying to, but um, like finding happiness what in Krishna happiness, like chanting or reading Bhagavatam, like cleansing and awakening. But question is like, I'm forgetting. So You're I'm forgetting. I'm fluttering. But forgetting, 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 oh. forgetting, yeah, forgetting. So, welcome to the club. Welcome. That's, that's one question. Yeah. But it's Good. not a question, it's a comment. And it's a stage of bhakti. Okay. There's a nice Sanskrit names called Anishtata Bhakti. It's unsteady. Or Mishra Bhakti, another mixed. Thanks. You're not unmixed yet. Welcome to the club. Okay. So how do you get unmixed? That's the next question. Next question. Yes. Next one. By following the process with faith, qualitative, following of the process. The main quality is with faith. So you have to have the right process. That means you have to have the right teaching and the right teacher and thus the right process. And then you submit yourself to the teacher and the teaching so that you're connected to the right process. Then you stay with it. That's, you know, sadhana properly performed brings purification. How did, you know, so that's called anarchanabriti. Hmm. Unwanted things within can become cleansed by Pajana Kriya, properly performed. How long does it take? However long it takes, that's how long it takes.
Next. Um, yeah, that's all much. Thank you. Behind you. <clears throat> Online question. Okay. Guru Maharaj, thank you for an insightful lecture. I want to ask you about the rubbing effect. Which effect? Rubbing. Rubbing. The effect of our association slash friendships on us. For example, Krishna gave his association to Duryodhana, but he chose not to get rubbed off by Krishna. On the other hand, Prahlad did not choose to get rubbed off by Irani Kashipu. Kaikeyi chose to be influenced by Mantara. In our regular association with people, there is both good and bad in the same person and not two different people. I want to confirm my understanding that we need to take responsibility for getting rubbed off by others good or bad tendencies and we have a choice to get influenced or not. It is not that just being around them. We will get their good and the bads. Is that the correct understanding? No. The Krishna factor has, wasn't specifically addressed and the Krishna factor must be specifically addressed in order to get the proper picture, the full picture. That is to say, Krishna can intervene or Krishna can provide the protection for bad association or the inoculation from bad association. Krishna can provide that. So that depends on the variable here is what is our aspiration in relation to Krishna. Now most of us are in the unsteady stage like was described prior question. Sometimes, sometimes less, sometimes more, sometimes in between, sometimes stuck, sometimes something. We're in this unsteady stage. So the, the dependency is moment to moment our inclination towards Krishna, reciprocation that Krishna will extend. But, you know, when there is sincerity, even when the inclination has diminished, Krishna can provide protection. Mm. And that's the bhakti principle. And Krishna's protection comes through representatives of Krishna. Krishna wants to see that you are kindly <clears throat> disposed unto those who are dear to him. And when Krishna sees that, he smiles and he'll help. So that, that, that's the, the, the unspoken part of the, this online question is the Krishna factor. Next. What strength, follow the same person, what strengthens our choices to discriminate between what to get rubbed off and what not to get from that person? Well, that, that's, you need, you need Guru Sadhu Shastra to guide you in the answer to that question. It's not like flip a coin. It's either heads or tails. There are shades, there, there are subtleties, and one needs proper understanding of scripture under the guidance of Guru and Sadhu. And then one can make the proper discrimination, what, what not. And again, Krishna factor. From Atulya Didi, from Boston. That's it. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, so I am trying to understand the difference between the cleansing process and the awakening process. Uh, by chanting, we are able to cleanse the heart. Now, what the uh, process that uh, gives the awakening. There's an original con 
<coughs> it's like this Manusha Nam Sahasratio verse. When the cleansing is complete, I may be less awake, more awake to my real identity, my real happiness, my original and eternal relationship with Krishna. Starting with, as his servant, what to speak of, then further and further and further. So that's the awakening. The, the, the loving service relationship with Krishna, put it in simple language. Then there's details that go further from there. Okay. Thank you, Mahasi. So, Guru Maharaj, that is a Brahma Bhutta platform. What about it? So, like the cleansing, the cleansing happened already, but you are not spiritually awakened fully. So, so it is an intermediate state. What's the rest of the verse? Brahma Bhutta Prasanatma Na Sojati Na Kangsati Samak Sarveshi Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktim Labate Param Mad Bhaktim Labate Alab Labha You you attain devotional service. Hmm. When the neutral stage is there, one may, by the mercy of Krishna, by the mercy of one carrying Krishna Bhakti, Bhakti may awaken. That's the further stage. After cleansing is the awakening. Thank okay. you. On the ladies' side, anything? Yes, one more. And then we're going to end. Maharaj, uh, maybe my question is wrong. Maybe my question is wrong. Um, wrong? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just... Um, in the Arjuna Leela which you mentioned, um, Krishna takes Arjuna to, to visit Mahavishnu to bring back the nine sons. Yes. So, that Mahavishnu, is he Karnotakasai Vishnu? Yes. Mahavishnu, same. Shida Prabhupada ki? Jai. Jai. 